Hello, I'm Professor Dale Smith, and this is the American College of Surgeons History of Surgery Curriculum Module, Surgery and War. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. There is a long association of surgeons, as the managers of trauma, with war, because since the ancient Egyptians, when civilized societies have sent their citizens into harm's way, they have sent their medical providers to limit the damage as much as practical. Ancient Egypt left some hints of military medical care, but it was not until the High Roman Empire that true military medical systems emerged, supporting the fighting force with enlisted medical soldiers, dedicated professionals, and fixed hospitals along the frontier. But such systematic organization vanished from the 5th through the 19th centuries. The 19th century Russian military surgeon, Nikolai Paragoff, described war as an epidemic of trauma. And like other epidemics, the experience in war is compressed. The surgeon sees cases concentrated in both time and space, allowing them to make observations, to test theories, and to otherwise explore the limits of their practice. For individual surgeons, many of them influential in surgical history, war experience was a defining moment in their practice lives. The trauma of war is more profound as well as more frequent than in civilian practice, and much of the surgical literature since the Middle Ages deals with wound surgery for soldiers. Experience treating combat wounds thus informed the management not only of civilian trauma care, but also elective conditions, with military surgeons gaining experience and confidence otherwise unattainable. An example is the work of Ambrose Paré, who accidentally discovered that gunshot wounds did not require cauterization, and slowly came to realize that ligation of bleeding arteries was also preferable to cauterization in many cases. He needed to develop tools to support the practice and illustrated them in his writings so other surgeons could have them duplicated. The new standard of care also required greater anatomical knowledge and helped fuel broader scientific education in the surgical guilds. Nation states sponsored surgical communities in large part for their value in military operations. Military surgical communities provided standard buyers for surgical instruments which led to the development of instrument-making commercial sectors. But the value of the surgeon was not just in trauma. The isolation of military operations, particularly naval settings, led to the expansion of the scope of practice into disease management and prevention, the traditional domains of the MD educated physician. The sponsorship of the state allowed the transfer of these standards into civilian practice. By the 19th century, the use of war injuries to expand surgical experience was high art. Military experience was frequently important in establishing surgical reputations. But real advances in surgery depended on changing the scientific parameters under which surgery occurred. That is, the development of anesthesia, asepsis, and a scientific physiology. But just the experience of using anesthetics convinced many American doctors who practiced in the Civil War that surgery was undervalued as a therapeutic modality. As surgery in the scientifically controlled hospital operating room became safer, and curative surgical therapy became practical for some conditions in the late 19th century, the lack of control in the conditions of trauma became increasingly challenging to surgeons. Surgeons in both industry, especially railway and factory practice, and in the military, recognized the need for and pioneered pre-professional aid to the injured. They aggressively studied the problems of pain, shock, and wound contamination. Another impact of war was that many people had surgery as a result of war wounds, or knew someone who did, and so society came to appreciate the power of surgical therapy in new ways. It is difficult to overestimate the impact of the American Civil War on the growth of surgical hospitals and post-operative nursing. Industrial war produces an overwhelming number of patients at one point. Their management requires the medical authorities to stage them in some way. Battlefield triage was introduced by Jonathan Letterman in the American Civil War, 
and techniques were developed and refined by the Prussian military medical services under Frederick von Esmark. They were common in European armies by the First World War. The overwhelming power of germ theory led surgeons in World War I to focus primarily on control of infection, both through vigorous wound toilet, usually reduced to a misuse of the French word debridement, and the introduction of germicidal solutions or antiseptics, such as the Carol Dakin treatment. In World War I, surgeons began to recognize that some surgery could wait and some surgery could not. Building on pre-war surgical experience and the opportunity to manage large numbers of cases, empirical progress was made not just in wound care, but in fracture management, head wounds, plastic and reconstructive surgery, urology, and several other areas of surgical practice. The problem of shock serves as a case in point. Academic surgeons like George Crile and Harvey Cushing had noted the relationship between blood pressure and the complication called shock in surgical operations early in the 20th century. Crile had begun to experiment with arm-to-arm -arm transfusion techniques to control interoperative shock and published his results in 1909. Crile demonstrated his technique and other surgeons experimented with it. But the anastomosing of blood vessels was difficult and dangerous. Various techniques were explored to collect and hold blood, but it coagulated very easily. Whipping the blood removed clots, and paraffin-lined containers helped. A common paraffinated bottle, developed just before the First World War by Clempton and Brown, was very useful. While various scientists studied shock and the roles of fluid expansion, several Canadian surgeons with pre-war American transfusion experience undertook transfusions in France. There was still much to learn and techniques were primitive, but the power of whole blood was so obvious to Canadian surgeon L. Bruce Robertson that in the spring of 1918 he changed the name of the holding ward in his casualty receiving station from the moribund ward to the resuscitation ward. After the United States entered the war, Oswald Robertson introduced citrated blood for transfusion purposes. But still, much remained to be done when the war ended in 1918. The post-war developments in surgery went forward in all areas, accelerated by the wartime experience. Blood transfusion in European and North American practice, infection control, fracture management, and specialization all enjoyed robust attention in surgical meetings. The coming of World War II in many ways revisited the experience of the First World War. Academic research ideas were tested on a massive scale. The availability of first sulfur and then penicillin allowed surgeons to worry less about controlling infection and more about the physiological condition of the patient. The management of trauma in North Africa and burn patients in Massachusetts following the Coconut Grove nightclub fire push surgeons into thinking more about fluids and electrolytes in surgical practice. In Italy in 1943, Lyman Brewster and his colleagues in Auxiliary Surgical Unit No. 2 recognized fluid buildup following thoracic surgery and developed positive pressure respiration therapy to help with wet lung syndrome. After World War II, Surgical specialization grew increasingly regularized, and the care of patients became the hallmark of surgical advance. The Cold War, a doctor draft, focused on the importance of graduate medical education, subspecialization, and the expansion of technology to further improve the ability to manage trauma patients. The helicopter and the artificial kidney were pioneered in Korea and were common by Vietnam. In the last third of the 20th century, the technology of roads and automobiles developed independent of social responses to them, and increasingly severe automobile accidents focused America's attention on trauma. The development of emergency medical systems and trauma surgeons as a subspecialty then allowed the empirical techniques to be underpinned with scientific studies and evidence-based practice, so that damage control surgery in the last 15 years of the century could be developed and staged. Recognition in the late 1990s by both military working groups and civilian surgeons 
that the staged management of patients with the trauma triad, the pathophysiologic combination of hypothermia, acidosis, and coagulopathy, would be required to reduce trauma deaths. These issues have been empirically refined in the ongoing revision of the tactical combat casualty care protocols during the recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Tactical combat casualty care is, as one would predict from previous wars, currently impacting civilian EMS and trauma management. Ergoff was particularly insightful when he described war as an epidemic of trauma, because like all epidemics, it concentrates the attention on particular aspects of the medical problem. The forced empiricism of the patient in front of you requires the extrapolation of all your medical knowledge. War in medicine, war in surgery, have a particular symbiotic relationship hope you will avoid in your practice. The one that you need to understand as part of the heritage of the profession you are about to enter. <laughs>